Uh, if you're our guest, welcome. It's awesome to see some new faces here. And um, what an incredible service it's been thus far. Um, I'm grateful for Mel and uh, Augustine doing an incredible welcome right there. Mel's one of our great interns, and Augustine is so radiant today, is he not? Uh, he's a dating man now. No, but I'm just uh, really grateful for him, uh, all the work he does with Nancy, with Mercy. Uh, you know, this night, on the 19th, we have our Mercy blood drive, so if you haven't signed up, definitely talk to the date man himself, Augustine, in the back. Uh, we had some birthdays this past week as well, amen? It was Nancy's birthday, Anais' birthday, our dear sister Julie Saunders' birthday. So it was uh, a lot of great things that's happening. Who else? Oh, yeah, Liz's birthday. <laughs> I want it to be my birthday. <laughs> nah, but uh, I'm really grateful for Liz and all the others, and uh, just really grateful for uh, your hearts and serving God's people. Uh, what an incredible uh, GNN video to see what God is doing all around the world. And uh, we're not just a local church. We're, we're a movement. You know, uh, we believe in evangelizing the nations in our generation. And so, as you see on the video uh, earlier, that's what we're all about. We're really trying to see God's dream, not just here in the Southland area, but all around the world. And so, God is allowing a lot of transitions to happen. And uh, one of the amazing transitions that wasn't of note on the video is our dear brother Donnie Boone will be moving and to be closer with family over there in the mighty Chicago church. Amen. And uh, we have one more service with Donnie Boom. And so uh, let's encourage our brother uh, this week. Uh, he'll be being sent out on the 20th, our, our day of our special mission Sunday service. So I love you, bro. Um, but let's get into our lesson. Amen. Uh, pull your Bibles out, if you will. You know, as a, as a, as a region, we've been focusing uh, on, a, on a theme these last couple of months. Uh, one month we focus on prayer. The, the following month after that, we focus on sharing is caring. It was, it's good to share. It's been more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Uh, but I, I was just really praying and thinking through the needs of the church. And uh, the need, I think, the call of the hour for us to focus on now as a theme is family. You know, and I was doing some research. And uh, around the world, some of the top things people care about the most, one is love. People care about friendships. Uh, they care about animals. Uh, I think we all love some animals here and there. Uh, everyone loves to be inspired, tolerant, basically uh, the coexisting of one another, what you are willing to tolerate and what you're willing to not tolerate. You follow me? Uh, a lot of people care about laughter. A lot of people care about music. A lot of people care about their happiness. And one of the top ones a lot of people care about is family. You know, all around the world, family is so important. It doesn't matter what culture or background you're from. Everyone loves being around family. You know, one thing about family, it radicalizes people. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a reason why people respond like, hey, what did you say about my mama? <laughs> what did you say about my mama? It's a reason why we respond that way. It's a reason why moms, uh, you hear these incredible stories extraordinary stories that moms are, 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 are lifting up cars or doing whatever they need to do to protect their family. Um, it's the reason why people go the extra mile and, and travel the distance, not just for a vacation, but to do whatever it takes to be amongst family. And one thing I love about the Bible is that God's perspective is that he desires family as well. And a cursing thing, you know, we get to be a part of a spiritual family. And I hope that if you're our guest, I pray and I hope that you feel encouraged that you also too feel part of the family. You know, one thing about family is just that you don't choose who you become cousins with or you don't choose your brother. You see what I'm saying? It just is. <laughs> but family, it just is. Like, hey, I didn't choose you, but guess what? You didn't choose me either. But we got to be family. And it's not something that I just want us to talk about or it's like a lingual, or it's like a buzzword, but I really want to actually be real family. You follow me? Which brings me to the title of my lesson today, Real Family. Amen? And here's the thing. If we're going to be a spiritual family, what better way to learn from the Bible itself? Let's go over to the book of Acts. 
You know, the book of Acts is the, the beginning of God's family on earth. It was the church, also known as the kingdom, also the part of the body of Jesus. Jesus being the head and part of the body was, guess what? When someone spiritually got baptized in the waters of baptism, full, full immersion under water, right, they became part of God's family. God was the father and, you know, Every single soul that was saved became part of God's children. And now they made God's children amongst each other brothers and sisters. So it's a spiritual family that talks about Ephesians 2. And I just wanted us to focus on three quick areas when it talks about family. One, friendly fire. Two, having an attitude of gratitude. And number three, making the most of every opportunity. In Acts chapter 6, let's pick it up here. Uh, point number one, friendly fire. Up until this point, the church has been growing numerically, uh, spreading geographically, and God's kingdom was at, just at an all-time high. The church was growing. But let's pick it up here in Acts 6 and beginning at verse 1. And in the Bible it reads, it says, In those days, when a number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in a daily distribution. Of food. Let's pause here. Friendly fire. You know, friendly fire is a military term. It's basically when someone unintentionally hurt the same person, like an ally or like the same person that's on the same team. And so it's, it, it's, it's more detrimental in that sense because it's, it'd be the, the least person you expect to hurt you. But we have to understand a lot of us come from families. And there's no perfect family. And in the same sense, if the church is called to be the spiritual family, then guess what? There's no perfect church because there's no perfect spiritual family. And what that does, it, it really destroys our ideology of what the church should be all about. Because we all come from the world, we're like, oh, well, the church should be perfect. It should be like Jesus, right? <laughs> like, what? It, it, it should be no sin in the church. But the Bible doesn't really teach that. Obviously, a lot of the Pauline letters, a lot of the letters written to the church, were dealing with one thing, sin. <laughs> and they were teaching people how to conduct themselves to be family. And it's interesting because here in the Bible, in Acts uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, it talks about one of the things that happened was that people were being overlooked. And the word overlook, it means to fail to notice. Have you ever felt that way before? Like, man, no one noticed me today. No one even bothered to say hi. Maybe if you're married, hey, my husband didn't even compliment me. I got all dolled up. Really for Jesus, but man. <laughs> we all could feel overlooked. And now we got to go back to the scripture. Why was they overlooked? Why? Here's the thing. In verse 1, the first sentence, because the number of disciples was increasing. <laughs> it was so much going on in the church that all the needs were, wasn't able to be met. And so what happens when needs are not met on a consistent basis? People start to complain. And the reason why people start to complain, why? Because they're hurt. And I don't think in the scriptures, like, people attended to just wake up, like, you know what, I'm going to hurt this person today. You know what, I see Moses Cooley today, I just want to hurt him. No one thinks that way. If it is, it's super wicky, but no one thinks that way, right? So how did the church respond, the spiritual family, how did it, how did it respond from the scriptures? Look at verse 2. It says, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Drop down to verse 7. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And the church said, Amen. this is how a great church is built. And as all of these things are happening, we get to a place where people are overlooked, people feel hurt, and then all of a sudden, all the, all the eyes kind of go into leadership. Like, man, this, this is your church. Like, you're, you're called to lead it. 
And so as a family, what do they do? They problem solve as a family. It's like, you know what? This person needs some food. Hey, who can help? They start to delegate, like, okay, who is willing to help and be workers for the Lord? Not just come and fill up a pew, not just come and just be spectators, but who going to be Christians and serve God and God's people? And so because of this willing heart, people needs were met. And it's interesting because I think a lot of us who are American, <laughs> we can just put all the, 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 the weight on the leadership. We can put all the weight on the one who's supposed to be pastor in the church. But if one guy is trying to meet the need of an entire church, you better pray for that person. Because think about it, even coming from families where maybe it was just one mom in a household. Think about if it was just one parent in a household trying to meet the needs of the entire family. That's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. And a lot of us come from backgrounds like that. You follow me? So what happened here is that, man, they begin to share the load. Why? So the needs could be met. People could be encouraged. And when they're encouraged, they're fired up. They're happy. They're satisfied. And so for us, what can we learn from this passage? Well, we all have a lot of needs in this church. But we could problem solve as a family spiritually and biblically. And so here's the thing. We all come from backgrounds or, or, or one way or another from dysfunctional families. I know I do. <laughs> Anybody come from a dysfunctional family? Thank you for allowing me not to be by myself. Amen. That's family right there. I appreciate that. But here's the thing. Within our, within our family upbringing, all of us been hurt one way or another at some point. At some point, man, we felt the weight of just being hurt. And it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy, poor, <laughs> middle class. It didn't matter. Like, it was just what it was, right? The dynamic of it. And sometimes the dynamic is so, like, strained, it, it hurts even more. You follow me? And being hurt by not just anyone, but being hurt by your family member, the person you least expected, oh, you might as well just kill me now, right? Like, it, it, it hurts. It's painful. And it, how do we normally respond just as American people? Like, it's a psychology behind it, right? Either you fight or you flight. We fight back by pet evil with evil. Like, you know what? They didn't invite me to uh, the birthday party this year? Okay. Well, you're not invited to, to my kid's birthday party. Like, we go to here sometimes. Like, we get petty, right? Um, or we flee. We, we, we feel hurt and we suppress it. And we don't deal with it in a, in a spiritual manner. No one really teaches us since a young age how to actually conduct ourselves spiritually. You know, and I think about for my upbringing, uh, one thing I'm grateful for is that my mom really tried to fight to instill this in us. Uh, but family, if out of all people who's going to press your buttons, is going to be family members. You follow me? And so uh, I'm the youngest of three. And, um, you know, it's been times, uh, you know, just being the youngest, sometimes you can feel like, man, like, I'm overlooked here. <laughs> like, <laughs> as you get older, you become the tallest. Usually the youngest seems like they get taller than everyone, but... I just start to feel overlooked often at times. I wasn't able to play the video games when I wanted to. I was like, come on, man. Mom bought that for us. <laughs> for us. You know, but uh, also as a, as a young kid, uh, I really enjoy uh, baked goods. And one thing I really enjoy the most is still to this day some cookies. Ask my wife, man. I could go through a whole bag of cookies, some Oreos, done. Chips Ahoy, done. You know, Nutter Butter's done. <laughs> you follow me? And, um, it was, uh, my brother had some cookies, so you know what got my attention? It was those cookies, right? And so uh, I love my family because we, we, I come from a big family, so we always had our house like packed and filled with people just coming over and fellowshipping. And my cousins, they wanted some cookies, so you know, my brother's passing it out, and I was like, hey, Ron, I want some cookies too. And they kind of giving me a hard time just being an older brother, you know, he's loving, but he's just kind of giving me a hard time at times. But I took it personal. I didn't like that. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? So I took it personal. I was like, man, like, so sadly, in my, in my sinful nature, right, as a teen, uh, I start to kind of respond back with some unkind words. So him being an older, bro older brother, you know what that meant? It's like, oh, you disrespected me in front of family. Ooh. And so, you know, long story short, uh, hey, here, here's the thing, guys. We all jacked up, amen. 
Uh, long story short, what, I, what I've learned from this, like, this could even trickle into the kingdom. When we, when we start to feel overlooked, like, man, like, that brother and sister didn't even wave to me this time. Uh, usually they come from this side of the room and go all the way up to the corner just to give me a hug. But this time they didn't see me. And we could feel overlooked and we could start to take it personal. And what I had to learn is see, like, you know what? Sometimes it's not really about us. Sometimes people just got a lot going on in their lives, respectively, and they just tunnel vision, right? And we, we can't take it personal oftentimes. I know I took it personal, my brother, but we made uh, uh, men's, and I got that cookie, amen? amen. <laughs> Here's the thing for us. What can we learn from this? We can't take things so personal. Uh, we oftentimes, as a spiritual family, are going to hurt each other. I, I just, I just want to pop the, I just want to break the news to you. You're going to feel hurt by people in this room. You're going to feel hurt. And why? Because I'm in it. You're in it. And one thing we all have in common is what? Sin. The Bible talks about it. Romans 3.23, all far short of the glory of God. But it's one of those things in family you don't want to talk about. You see what I'm saying? Like, we never want to talk about our imperfections and shortcomings. Like, but it, it is what it is. But how do we learn to respond in a godly way? You know, as some practicals I want to just put before us is if you feel hurt by someone in this church, make a decision. One, either you go overlook the offense, as it says in Proverbs 19.11, and not take it personal. Two, you can have a deep love that covers over a multitude of sin, like it talk about in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, or you can learn to forgive. Just like Jesus was mistreated on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Sometimes people just make bonehead decisions. They don't even know what they're doing. Unintentionally. It's like, man, like, we missed our exit again. Huh. You know, like, man, we're always late. Uh, maybe that person just is not great at keeping time. <laughs> and that's their weaknesses, right? And you just got to learn to be very forgiving. And then four, apply the scripture Matthew 18, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 18, where it talks about if you see the person in sin, bring it up to the person. If you feel hurt, bring it up to that person. Get reconciled so you can be true family. If it doesn't work, bring in another family member. Bring in another person so you can be reconciled. Amen? Either way, we got to learn as a spiritual family to handle our difficulties and our differences spiritually. Now, here's the crazy thing. Most of us don't come from that background. Some do. Some understand this concept like, man, I'm family. This is kind of second nature to me, and that's awesome. But some, you got to be taught this. Some, you got to be taught this. And some are, because we've been hurt so much and abused so much, we're afraid of it. And so it's hard for us to really be true family if we could become feral. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the, the wet cat. <laughs> the wet cat and is just scratching you and don't, don't want to be tamed. Sometimes we could be like that wet cat. If we could just scratch, like, get out, get out. Yeah, yeah. I just want to I I be your brother. I just want to be your sister. Amen. <laughs> All it takes is to be real family by making biblical decisions. Are you with me, church? Amen. <laughs> Point number two, attitude of gratitude. Let's go to Acts and then uh, let's flip a couple of chapters over to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. So what happened ever, ever since uh, Acts chapter 6, obviously, the needs were met. And part of those needs is that they raised up some leaders, some guys who were willing to help meet the needs and be family. And one of those guys was Stephen. The next chapter, Stephen gets killed. He's starting to preach the word of God, and people didn't like it, and he becomes the first martyr. And we pick it up here in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Point number two, attitude of gratitude. Verse 1, it says, And Saul approved that they're killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he had said. For with streaks and pure spirits came out of many, 
and many were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. The attitude of gratitude. The Bible says that in the city of Samaria, in this whole region, this area, it was so much joy. And joy is a feeling, it's a feeling of happiness. It's a feeling of, 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 of pleasure. It's, it's just, it, you're so in awe, you're so amazed, you're so just fired up. You're excited. And it has a ripple effect on those around you. It's contagious. Just like a yawn. A yawn could be contagious, but also a smile could be contagious. Right? And it just comes from having a deep sense of gratitude. But may, you may wonder, like, okay, wait, context-wise, wasn't it just a big persecution that just happened? Like a lot of opposition, a lot of hardship, a lot of trial that was just happening in the midst of all of this? Like someone just got killed. How can someone out of their right mind be so excited with all of this going on? And you kind of think about even today's time, even with J.O. was sharing, like, we're in this inflation, the political climate never gets better, uh, it's still so much social unrest, yada, 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 yada. It's, the list goes on. How can you ever expect to be excited during this time of grief? How can you ever have a sense of joy in this time of suffering? It, it's like it don't add up, right? Why? What was the difference between these guys? Just their perspective. It was just their, their mindset was so changed. They were like, you know what? Since I'm godly, I'm not going to allow the things of the world take away my joy. It was an attitude of gratitude. It was just, a, it was just a, their nature, their mindset. It was, a, it was a shift of how they viewed themselves, but also how they viewed how God was working in their lives. Yes, the persecution happened. It had to happen. Because if you read a little bit into this text, context-wise, God gave them one simple rule. Go to all nations and make disciples. They got so caught up being in one city in Jerusalem and a lot of great things was happening, but God still had a plan. He's like, you know what? You got to get to all nations, dude. So he allowed this persecution to happen. And sometimes we don't understand, like, man, is God really behind all the, the suffering and allowing this stuff to happen? We can't see God in it all, and we can forget. And we can lose our sense of joy and our sense of gratitude. Why? Because we begin to be focused on the wrong things. You know, and oftentimes when we focus in the midst of the wrong things, what we tend to do is to take our eyes off Christ. And then we start to focus our eyes on each other. And we start to see all the shortcomings, all the imperfections in one another, and then we get critical. <laughs> and that's what family normally kind of do sometimes. We're family, right? And so let's kind of talk about that because it's, it's so easy. It doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to know that someone has issues. You, you follow me? But let's talk about that because we do got to get a biblical perspective here. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. Because oftentimes what we start to do, we, we get so focused on each other. We take our eyes off Christ and we forget the big picture what God is really trying to teach us through these hardships. In Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is impure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. The Bible just lays it out. He's like, hey, to the pure, all things are pure. It's like, why? Because their perspective is on straight. They're always focused on God. They see God through everything, the hardships, the, the, the good, the bad, whatever. And they got an attitude of gratitude. They're excited what God is teaching them and where God has them in that moment. And then you have the opposite. Those who may be defiled, the bitter person, the hurt person who doesn't deal and work it out with God. And everything is just an issue. Yeah. Everything is just a problem. The things that are supposed to be pure seems impure. Yeah. The thing that's supposed to be good is actually now becomes bad. And, and we start to shift our perspective. Why? Because our, we focus on the wrong things. We're focused on the wrong things. And so when it comes to family, we can lose our sense of gratitude and even our respect for each other. That's hurtful as well. We forget that. The stuff we start to think, then all, out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. And now we're saying words that's not even encouraging anymore. Now it's to tear us down. Let's talk about that as well. Because I think 
It's okay to have a preference and opinions, but sometimes, honestly, guys, they don't matter. <laughs> it's just an opinion. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So let's, let's talk about that a little bit, too. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. We could get so caught up in the debatable matters, even as family, like, well, this and that, this and this, 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 this. And it's just like, wait, what is this conversation? How did we even get here? You know what I mean? Like, it became about something else where we was focused on this topic. And, you know, it's interesting because what I love about the Bible, you kind of see the same effects there as well. It's not just a 21st century thing. It was actually a first century thing. Um, and Romans, obviously, is during a time of hardship. They were being persecuted. They were being killed by non-Christians because of their faith. And also, we forget to see, like, the fact by this time you had Jews who became Christians, and you also had Greeks who became Christians. But even before that, the idea of how they viewed each other was very, like, racist. They, they, they already had differences because of the, the worldly uh, perspectives that they had amongst each other. But now that they're becoming Christians, now they got to deal with each other's differences. It just didn't go, over, go away overnight because they were spiritual family. You follow me? But let's talk about, look at Romans chapter 14. We're going to pick it up here at verse 10. Again, attitude of gratitude. Verse 10, it says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to be any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. Uh, unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, here's the thing, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in his way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Then it goes on and talks about how we got to strive to make every effort to do what leads to peace in mutual edification, meaning building each other up as a family. You see, they had differences even in the first century. And all the things that they were like going through and the stuff that we could even feel, they went through. And the Bible teaches that, hey, just don't be a stumbling block to each other. And don't do it intentionally. Hey, you may have opinions. You may have thoughts. But is it really necessary? Is it going to build this person up or is it just going to tear them down? And the Bible says, hey, don't project because they was getting caught up in like who's eating what and what's what and what's right and what's clean and what's unclean. Because again, you have some Jews who normally wouldn't eat certain foods, but the Greeks would eat it. So in order to have a sense of peace, you went on one side to still act in a sense of love for the sake of those Jews so you don't steer their conscience, right? They want to be family. You don't want to be a stumbling block. But this is even a trickle into our, uh, our church fellowship even nowadays in the 21st century to, to, to a degree. Right? Oftentimes, some of us, we have, you know, preferences, maybe a song, maybe how we dress, maybe how people conduct themselves or even speak. Uh, we all have opinions. And we all have preferences, which is fine. You, this, that's what your, your, your free will, right? But some things is just debatable matters that really doesn't matter at the end of the day, to be honest. You know, if, if, if it's not in the scriptures and you can't find it in the scriptures, you can't show me in the scriptures, does it, does it really, is it necessary? You follow me? And I think sometimes we could, we could swing the pendulum so far. We got to have a balancing act. We don't want to be like a stumbling block. But we also got to, if, if, if this is what fires people up and it's, they're genuine about worship of God, and that's what truly what matters at the end of the day, that they're being close to God. And so we got to have a balancing act. And I think sometimes being Americans, we could swing the pendulum one way or another. And that's not righteous either. You know, some can even have an opinion about everything that we do even as a church. Oh, we got to do this. We got to do this again. Oh, oh, oh. Amen. You know, that's your opinion. But does it really matter? We're trying to win a world. Last time I checked, we're at war with the devil. You see what I'm saying? Some may even develop an opinion about me. 
and the way I do leadership or whatever, like, amen, that's, I appreciate it. But uh, to pop everyone's bubble, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. I could consider it, but if it's, if it's going to, like, tear me down and not allow for me to, to grow and it's not constructive feedback, like, I don't care. It's enough, like, it's already enough going on in my life, like, you know what I mean? And so, like, it's not going to take away from me understanding I'm truly called by God. It's not going to, like, phase me. Like, I understand I'm called by God. I knew that years ago. And I know what God has already done through me and the miracles I've seen that God has allowed for me to be a part of. I don't need human approval. All I am is approved by God. Are you with me? Here's the thing. A, a, a tree is recognized by its fruit, and it's going to be revealed one way or another. Time would, time would be the essence of that. You see what I'm saying? And so we have to understand as a kingdom, it's not a matter of drinking or eating. It's not about all these opinions. But it's, it's, a, it's a kingdom that's based on righteousness, peace, and joy. And we can lose our sense of gratitude, and we can get so focused on all these other things that really don't matter at the end of the day. And it takes away from our deep sense of gratitude amongst each other. You know, something I'm really grateful for um, is my wife. You know, uh, this past week we celebrated four years being married in the kingdom of God. Amen. And uh, as I was just kind of reflecting on it, I was like, wow, this, well, this, is, this is amazing. Like, God's, here's the thing, brothers, sisters, God's way is the best way. You do it, you do it God's way, it's no regrets, no shame, man. And so for those who may desire to date one day and be married, like, do it God's way. Amen. But as I was reflecting on my life, I was like, wow, like, this is amazing. Um, I'm married to an amazing, beautiful woman of God. I uh, have the same conversion that I do, <laughs> you know, uh, raising up a, a, an incredible daughter of ours. And, um, and I just reflect on all the goodness that we have in the kingdom. And I just reflected on my past life, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. Um, if you look at the marriages in, uh, across the world, like, a lot of people don't even get, make it to four years of marriage. You know, like some people don't even make it to that, right? Been married that long. Sometimes, now we live in a day and age, people don't even believe in marriage most of the time. Yeah. They'd rather just uh, cohabitate with each other and just like, oh, it's, it's expensive. You know, like, all right, dude. You know, like, it's expensive, right? Um, and here's the thing I know I got issues, and I know my wife sees a lot of it. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot of it, right? I'm grateful for your grace, babe. Amen. Um, but here's the thing. I can see the, the, the few amount of imperfections of JL. Because we're married. Just a few. Just a few. Right? And, and, and here's the thing. When we're focused on the wrong things, man, it's not a great sight. But when we're focused on the right things, it's awesome. And I love you, babe. Amen. You know, uh, I believe Curtis, May, uh, Curtis Mayfield said it best. He says, though you may not drive a great big Cadillac. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, TV antennas in the back. You may not have a car at all. But remember, brothers and sisters, you can still stand tall. Just be thankful for what you got. <laughs> Amen. That deserves a round of applause right there. Amen. How, how all of this apply to us today? You know, the holidays are coming up. And for some, it's, it's the most uh, charitable uh, uh, time of the year. It's the most uh, joyful time of the year for some. But for some, it, it's, it's more depressing than others. Because it's also during a time period where a lot of people don't get a chance to spend with loved ones. Maybe this past year, loved ones been lost. I mean, we're still, you know, facing COVID. Um, Maybe the pillars in your life and your upbringing are gone. And so for some, uh, while a lot of people are enjoying their, their time together as family, for some, it, it feels very isolated. For some, it can feel very lonely. You know, and, and so it's not a time for us to check out and be like, okay, I got my church family. Here's my uh, physical family. No, 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 no. The church has to be your real family. It has to be your real family. It has to be your real family. And so don't allow this to be a time where we check out and check away from our people. Actually, allow this to be a time where we draw closer to our people. Amen? But also allow this to be a time where we're actually having an attitude of gratitude, having a sense of joy. Like, we should be able to see this in the, in the singing. We should be able to experience this in the fellowship. 
I mean, we can see it in people's faces, even right now, right? It should be a sense of joy. Why? Because you're saved. You have health. You're alive. You have breath. You can praise God. Some people wish they could have that. But we can lose sight of that when we're ungrateful and we miss what's important. I want to challenge this. And I love what my wife was saying. But I want to challenge you guys, too, at the church to write 10 things you're grateful for. Allow those 10 things to just allow for you to remember. Because sometimes we can forget. Our life gets so busy. And we could just forget the little small things that matter. The small things, they may seem small, but they're really a big deal. Allow those things to, to remind you of your walk with God, your relationship with your God, right? And allow that to stimulate some joy in your life. Amen? If you're a guest, man, I want to challenge you. If you don't know what that looks like, get with the person that invited you out. Study the Bible. See what true joy comes from, which is a relationship with God. And it only comes from understanding that through the Bible. Amen? Amen. Point number three, last and final point coming to land, the plane here. Uh, point number three, make the most of every opportunity. Let's go uh, to Ephesians chapter five. Y'all still fired up? Yeah. Let's go. Oh. Ephesians chapter five, we pick it up here in verse 15. It says, be very careful then how you live as unwise. Uh, be very careful then how you live not. So you want to make sure you not as unwise. <laughs> not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, the Bible says make the most of every opportunity. And it's interesting, it also talks about this same phrase in Colossians 4 or 5. And why would you need to make the most of every opportunity? Well, from the scriptures, we see that the days are evil. <laughs> there's so much wickedness. There's so much hate that's going on in this world. And because of that, God is coming back. And he's coming back with vengeance. And he's coming back to destroy the world. And so the Bible says, hey, understand what God's will is. God wants every single person in this room saved. And if you don't have a relationship with God, man, it's time that starts today. This starts today. And if you're studying the Bible and it's something that's holding you off, you need to repent and get right with God starting today. God's will is to have everyone come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. That's awesome. Great deal. It's a great deal. But it's interesting that this happened, and we see this through the scriptures in the, in the church of Ephesians. But it makes me think, well, what was the, the bread render? What, what did, how did it all begin? Like, it, this is the end result of it, the byproduct of it. Their, their mindset, how did it get there? I'm glad you asked. Thank you for asking. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. How did it get there? Acts chapter 2, um, during this time period, you had a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people coming to celebrate the day of Pentecost, and they only understood to worship God one way. However, obviously through scriptures being fulfilled and God's ushering in his spirit, to really exemplify that he was working and being present in this moment. And it's really awesome because at this moment, this is when the Jews actually become safe, right? And we pick it up here in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. And it says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Day, who's the day? Those who just got saved. It says, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily additions. God was working in an incredible way here, but what we see is that the church back here in Acts chapter 2 made the most of every opportunity. Why? In the same light of things, they understood man, I killed Jesus, and God could come back any given second now. I got to believe that he's not just the Messiah, but he was Lord. And I put him on the cross. And, and it's interesting because some people wasn't even there when Jesus was flogged and 
and whipped and all these different things. They just came to, to celebrate the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish festival. And Peter had this message, and it was a good message, but in order to understand the good message, you got to understand the bad side of the message as well. You follow me? And the bad message was that your sin killed Jesus. And you may ask, well, I wasn't there. That was like over 2,000 years ago, right? I'm good today. No, because here's the thing. We all have sin. So if we have sin, guess what? Your sin killed Jesus. And that was the message. But it was a good message because of that, and they faith in the message that now a relationship with God that they can actually overcome their sin and have new life in Christ. Because that's what Jesus did on the cross. He died on the cross for our sin, resurrected on the third day, now sits at the right hand of God. And that's a good message. It's a liberated message. It's a freedom message. And man, 3,000 believed that message. And what was their lifestyle afterwards? That they made the most of every opportunity. Well, how do we know? It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the teaching. They had fellowship. They were a family. They were a real family. All these people didn't come from just the same family background. They came from different walks of life, different geographic areas. And then one day they made a decision to be family. It didn't take them years. They made a decision. It says that day. They made a decision like, you know what? Oh, wow, you're in the kingdom too. Oh, me too. Oh, that's awesome. When did you get baptized? Oh, just today. Oh, me too. <laughs> Man, we're family. I know. That's crazy. That's crazy. I never had a Roman brother before. Oh. Wait, you're Jewish? Oh, this is awesome. They made a decision to become family. You know, as time goes on, when you get to Acts 10, then God ushers in the kingdom to the Greeks, and they become family. And by the time you get to Acts 19, then the church in Ephesus gets started. And that's how you got the book of Ephesians, right? What was the message? They made the most of every opportunity. And oftentimes, we could take one thing for granted, and that's time. We could take time for granted. And so because of these guys understood and they were plugged in to the reality that, man, time could just end like this. So as long as it depends on, on, on me today, yes, it depends on God. You pray like it depends on God, but you work like it depends on you. They made the most of every opportunity. And you see it in their lifestyle. They, they opened up their homes to one another. They strengthened one another. They, they provided for each other's needs. And also they were focused on the mission to seek and save a lost world because they made the most of every opportunity. You know, as a kid, growing up, um, I'm really grateful for my mother um, just, in, just teaching us to, in the same sense, to kind of share the same principle. Because um, understanding, like, we come from, obviously, like, you know, um, the background we grew up in is just uh, the poverty, right? Like, the projects, public housing. And oftentimes, growing up in that setting, sometimes your upbringing, you see people you're close to, and then a couple of years later, you stop seeing them because of, like, just foolish gang violence, it's just nonsense, right? And so from a very young age, I really start to embrace the concept of just family. Uh, because you don't know how long that person or that individual is going to be in your life. And so time became a, a, a very precious to people, right? And I'm really grateful because my mom, what she always would teach us, like even as a family, is to always call your uncles, always call your aunts. You just never know. Keep calling your grandmother, you know, um, and so when they do pass, like, you would never feel like a sense of regret because you did everything possible to be involved in their lives. You follow me? And I think this is the same aspect we got to bring into the kingdom because here's the thing. We're part of a movement, and a movement moves. And if we don't take a precious time and focus on even now and embracing one another, a couple of months from now, some of you guys in this room may not even be here anymore. Some of you guys might be getting the call just like Jay and I got the call, uh, what was it, last month. <laughs> Amen. Last month, right? And um, just to uproot yourselves to, to continue to spread the gospel. You just don't know. So as long as it depends on us today, we got to embrace that and make the most of today. You got to make the most of today. If we don't have time to, like, build family years later. We got to start now. Why? Because there's needs in this church. Some in this church don't even feel close to people in this room right now. Yeah. And we could change that by opening up our homes, just getting, like, they don't even have to be an agenda. Like, hey, man, I just want to know more about you. It's awesome to hear Miguel share about, like, man, like, 
I get to be in the kingdom of God. It changed his life. And now he's your brother, right? Amen? Yeah. It's awesome to see Tiffany baptized not too long ago, being just amazed by the kingdom of God because it was family. It was something different about this church. And that's something we got to continue to foster and continue to teach amongst each other day in and day out. It's easy to be forgotten. And it's easy to be taken for granted. Are you following me? You know, uh, I want to lift up our dear sister and congregational shepherd, Lisa Davis. You know, uh, I heard yesterday they had an incredible Woman of Wisdom brunch. And uh, honestly, I, I just really appreciate it. Just looking at that picture, I was like, wow. Uh, I think it was at Yvonne's house. I've been over there once, you know. Oh, Brenda's. I'm sorry, Brenda's. And um, I've been over there as well, <laughs> amen. And uh, just seeing the, the incredible Woman of Wisdom in the ministry, I was like, wow, this is your family. You know, and I'm really proud of that Bible talk because um, that Bible talk is pretty much almost like close to their goal of missions. Like at this point, majority of their Bible talk knocked out their missions because they're plugged in. They understand it's a family. You know, I want to lift up the, uh, the Kyle Moore's Bible talk, the Grow Bible Talk, amen? <laughs> that they're plugged in because they understand it's a family. And they already like knocked out their missions as a Bible talk over 100%. And not everybody is, it, it has even given yet. So just imagine what God's going to do even through that. You know, I'm thankful for you guys, honestly. Ever since my wife and I even came to Southland, you guys embraced us as family. And it's not going without, like, without notice or without any type of impact. We get to take that same love that we have here in Southland and bring it to those in San Francisco. You know, I'm really grateful for you guys. But I do want to challenge us because I think it's still an area of growth that we can really continue to improve upon. Some, I believe, is natural to you just to, to become family. And for some, again, it's, it's a teaching moment, right? But I want to challenge us to make the most of every opportunity today. Applying yourself to the person God's put in your life to help you grow and mature spiritually. Make the most of every opportunity by not just hitting your missions, but blowing it out. Because we've got to take care and build up the spiritual family all around the world. And make every effort to deepen the relationships with those in this room. Not just those like you're close to, because sometimes it could be, be clickish. I just, I just want to be out, honest. You know, if we, could, we, could, we, could, we get easily, we could become clickish. It's a natural thing. It's, it's a psychology to that. You know, birds of a feather, what? Opposites, what? Amen, psychology, right? But we could have that in the kingdom, and it can't be that way. The, this, is, this is what makes the kingdom so special. You have people from, that's very unique from all types of backgrounds, but they get to be family. You could be truly family. You see what I'm saying? And I think sometimes we, we, we could take away from that when we don't deepen those relationships and get to know each other on a personal level. Amen? As we conclude, if you take the F in friendly fire, and you take the A in attitude of gratitude, and you take the M from making the most of every opportunity, you get the word fam. Right? We're short for family. Amen? It's short for family. And we got to be real family. Let us not just say it with our, 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 our words, but let's display it through our actions. Yeah. Let's display it on a daily basis. You know, the most radical thing you could ever do, they say, is to be consistent. And so let's, let's be consistent in three areas as we focus on building family. Let's, 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 let's focus on having a sense of gratitude, right? Let's focus on giving our hearts, even when we have friendly fire, and let's focus on making the most of every opportunity. With that, guys, thank you, and to God be all the glory. Yeah.